Hey everyone, thanks for joining us again for another Hoboken Talks. We're broadcasting live from the Hoboken Historical Museum Upper Gallery. And you're, you're on one of the platforms, obviously, but you can check us out now on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Uh, and then this broadcast will be archived on those platforms uh, for the future. Maybe not Twitter. I'm not sure about that, but mainly YouTube. And we've been doing this program now since January. And so this is episode number 12. Uh, past shows have included interviews with Chris Lopez, Victoria Mayeno, uh, and Greg Delaquilla, Karen Cool, Jack Silbert, and the hosts do change. My name is Bob Foster. I'm the director of the museum, but you can very well expect other hosts as we go into our future programs. Again, every Thursday at 7 p.m., Hoboken Talks and thanking our engineer uh, and producer, Rand Hoppe, who is nearby in case we really step on something. And tonight's guest is a very special person. Uh, it's Maria Lara, who's sitting to my left, and uh, she's, uh, I guess we'll say she's an educator. Is that a fair description? Yeah. Okay, and Maria's right here. <laughs> and uh, I should say the background that you're seeing is like a little overwhelming, a little busy, but when Maria worked with the museum as our full-time educator, uh, she just could really get people in the palm of her hand. It was kind of like the Pied Piper. And so, Maria, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Bob. It's it's a pleasure to be here. It's, a, it's, it's very good to see you. Uh, we always do mention that uh, I myself have been vaccinated. I know you've had your shot, My first shot, your first shot, but we do have a plexi screen between us, and usually we hold up our Hoboken mugs to show people that. So you're not kind of stressed out. And then of course we look at this picture in the background in our on our green screen and we think of those were the good old days where social distancing was not happening and the museum itself has not been doing story time okay. for a long time. We've mm -hmm. done some other programming with distancing, but uh, this this is the good old days in the background. Yeah, definitely a uh, shout out to Jack Silver because I have seen some virtual story times he's done. So it's yep. such a great job on his part. <laughs> sure, sure. Yeah, we've been we've been having fun with the virtual, mm -hmm. but it doesn't get the blood going mm -hmm. the same way. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, one of the reasons we asked you on is that this is the museum's 20th anniversary in the shipyard. And then there's 15 years before that when you could say we were, you know, getting our act together. So that's 35 years. Mm -hmm. uh, but you played a very important part as our first full-time museum educator, I believe. And, uh, uh, you know, before we get into any of that, just tell us a little bit about your background. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, again, I want to thank you for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here in my old stomping grounds. Um, so a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Maria Fernanda Lara, and I was born in Santiago de Chile. Uh, my family and I uh, emigrated from Chile and came to Hudson County in September of 95. So I was only five years old at the time. Uh, and I've I've grown up all my life in Hudson County, so it is the only thing that I, I know. Uh, I grew up as an undocumented uh, youth, um, so that was kind of a struggle for me in, you know, going to college and then the university, obtaining jobs. Um, but that was a hurdle that I, you know, overcame, uh, and it has given me uh, the grit and perseverance to uh, you know, work in education here at the museum and at my current job, True Mentors. So just kind of curious, do you remember anything from that, you know, time before you came here? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, that's a great question. Unfortunately, I don't remember uh, Chile too much other than very distinct memories. So one of my most favorite memories actually was going to El Campo, uh, which we call, I guess, the farm. So I have my extended family of uh, uncles and aunts and cousins. They live in El Campo. So my 
parents would take me every weekend and it was amazing because you saw cows and chickens and you know I, I, I just got to get dirty and be a tomboy and and really be active so I, I remember that and then I also actually remember my school so I was probably in I don't know pre-k3 or something like that so I, I do remember uh, my teachers actually I had two teachers one with curly hair curly black hair and one with uh, blonde hair. So those were very nice memories. Um, and then everything else that I remember is here. Right. Um, and did you recently or the last couple of years go back there? Yeah. So uh, the first time I went back to Chile uh, must have been in 2011. Uh, that's when I obtained my temporary residency. Um, and I went back for the first time after many years. And it was it was amazing to just uh, you know, be in, in my land again, right? It's almost like the roots are still there. Um, and then recently I went again in 2019 and I got to spend a few months there. So oh. I got to travel from the Southern part of Chile to the Northern part. Um, and that was just great because it was really learning more about my culture, my heritage, and just the diversity that's also in Chile. And you still have family there. Yeah, so. I do. I have uh, my sisters out there. Uh, shout out to my sister, my nieces, uh, my cousins. So they're they're all there. Uh, and then here is my immediate family. Right. And so what were some of the issues when you first came here? Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, schooling, language. I guess you didn't know English, did you? No, yeah, no. no, you're just... Speaking Spanish, learning to speak Spanish too. <laughs> yeah, I mean. um, that's a great question. Yeah, what, what were some of those hurdles, right? Well, the first one absolutely is the language. Uh, I knew no English, so I was placed in bilingual classes from kindergarten to about third grade. Um, the beautiful part about that was that you're in a classroom setting with other uh, immigrant children who also don't understand the language, right? So you're there learning with each other and then your teachers are also, um, you know, come from a Latinx background, so they know how to handle that. So that was nice. Um, but then I guess also with, with, my, with my parents, right? Finding a job um, and just going from a lifestyle that we lived in Chile, you know, very nice household, et cetera, to something a little bit different. We first lived in a basement and you know, that upward mobility uh, just went from there. Right. And what town is this in Hudson County? Uh, so I came to West New York, New Jersey. <laughs> and I I say that I was raised in West New York. I say I am born in Chile, but my I was raised in West New York. So everything that I know is is uh, West New York, Hudson County. <laughs> 201, right. as we call it. <laughs> 201. I, don't, I didn't know that. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And... Um, so many people are confused by just West New York as a town. Like, yeah. does it exist? Yeah. I mean, because they think it's New York mm -hmm. and it, oh, you know, you're just mean you live West of New York, mm -hmm. but it's actually obviously a uh, yeah. um, uh, town. So Bergen Line is in West New York? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, right, yeah Bergen Line. Uh, Bergen Line Avenue is in West New York. So it's Kennedy Boulevard, Boulevard East. Um, yeah, Bergen Line Avenue is such a beautiful street because you get to see the true essence of what diversity is in Hudson County. Um, you know, you get to see stores that are Colombian, Venezuelan, you know, you, you see La Panaderia Chilena, which is uh, the Chilean bakery, you know? So it's, it's a beautiful mesh of all these Latinx communities that uh, migrated to the States because, you know, they had to. <laughs> right. And uh, to me, it's the most exciting street in Hudson County. <laughs> I mean, I got to nice. tow the Hoboken line and say Washington Street. But if I want to be not challenged, but if I want to be excited, uh -huh. I go to Bergen line cool. and I love going to the stores and, you know, just asking questions and negotiating the language. Obviously, I don't speak Spanish, mm. but, you know, people are really patient. Mm. And but I feel like I've traveled to another country, mm. which is exciting to me. Yeah, that's that's a, a very good comparison to that. You feel like you traveled to another country. Yeah. Absolutely. So um, so you went to the public schools mm -hmm. yeah. and uh, West New York. You graduated from high school in West New York. 
Yeah, so I started out at public school number one, uh, which is located on 62nd Street. I used to live. Do you have a comment time. from uh, Jessica oh, Gonzalez? Hello. Love Maria Lara. Okay. <laughs> Thank I, you. I know I, there's fans out there. Yeah, Jessica is my very close friend. Uh, and she actually got to volunteer at the museum through me. Okay. And she's also volunteered at True Mentor. So thank you, Jess, for being an amazing part of this community. <laughs> and uh, there's Carter Craft. It's been a privilege paddling at the Hoboken Cove Community Boathouse. Yes. Carter, a great guy. We did and that in, in July. We did it for a uh, mentors and mentees program. Excellent. Nice. Excellent. Cool. I'm sure you'll do it again. Yes. Um, so we were talking about school. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you graduated from the high school. Yeah. So again, I went to public school number one. And then afterwards, I went to Memorial High School. Um, and I graduated from Memorial High School. While there, I was very active uh, in extracurricular activities. So uh, drama club was one of my most Really? Favorite. Wow. Yeah. So Elizabeth is on. Uh, we love to recognize people. A great picture from Elizabeth Brito and family looking good, guys. Do you okay. remember Ellie. She, I, oh, she of course. Wow. Yeah. And there's a new member in Ellie's family. Yes, she has okay. a baby, Leo. Oh, that's so funny. Ellie Beautiful. worked with us at the Fireman uh -huh. Museum and here also. And yes, very <laughs> cool. They're they're pouring in here. Uh, the Maria Fan Club. <laughs> and um, so there's back to high school. Mm -hmm. What's the, what happens after that? Um, after high school, I went to community college. So I went to Hudson Community College uh, and I went there from 2008 to 2011. Again, uh, I was an undocumented person. So I had to uh, pay my way through school, right? I, I didn't get any financial aid, et cetera. Um, and then afterwards I was granted my residency and I transitioned to New Jersey City University. Um, prior at Hudson Community College, I gained an associate's in early childhood because I always wanted to be a teacher. I, I knew uh, kids were part of my life. Uh, and then at NJCU, I transitioned into a sociology major uh, because I knew I wanted to do more Do you want to say hi that. to oh. <laughs> uh, Isadora? That's my niece. And cheese and hey, chili? See, yes. Oh, we've gone in international Latina, here. Yes. We love that. Yes. Our signal is working. We love that. <laughs> Hola. <laughs> um, and do you want to say Lupe, hi? Lupe, Lupe. She is, uh, she's currently in California. Lupe also grew up in Hudson County, New Jersey. So again, lots of my friends went through the same experience as us. Uh, Lupe from a Mexican background. So Lupe, gracias por estar aquí. <laughs> and, and you said you didn't tell anyone you were coming on the program. So I word is out. I few people, but I guess. <laughs> Um, so keep interrupting your education, but so you're at uh, NJCU, mm -hmm. as we say. Yeah, I went to NJCU and I majored in sociology. I honestly think, and I say this every day, that I am so happy that I majored in sociology. It was a way for me to understand society more and understand the complex questions, uh, even understand also education, because there are so many barriers when it comes to education. Uh, so I'm very grateful to NJCU. I'm very grateful for the mentors that I had at NJCU. Um, so shout out to Dr. Herman, uh, who you know very well. Um, and yeah, NJCU just changed my life. I even got to go to Italy with them. So that was Wow, cool. did one of those uh, abroad programs. Yeah, it was like a, a winter class. You're right, in between semesters. Yeah, 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 cool. Took Urban sociology it was excellent. Amazing. Excellent. And so travel seems to be something you really love to do. Mm. I think I, I enjoy travel because I enjoy learning about cultures. I'm very interested in cultures, uh, whether it's a culture that, you know, I have grown up with uh, or a culture that's very uh far distance from me. So even Italy, I, I, I had no idea uh, the amount of immigration that Italy gets, right? So that's something that I learned with NJCU. Um, and then also because uh, I grew up undocumented and not being able to travel for a very long time, now that I am able to, I want to get as much exposure as possible. Sure. I mean, um, I know you pretty well. Mm -hmm. And um, the 
I, I now as you talk about it, the being undocumented really formed a lot of your approaches to things, mm -hmm. I think, which I don't think I was aware of. Mm -hmm. And when you had different challenges not connected with that, mm -hmm. you just sort of saw there was a system and you kind of didn't freak out. You just attacked each level of it. And you always seem very cool about it. But I think you were uh, sort of sorting a lot of things out, mm -hmm. you know, when you first came, you know, working for the museum. So I, I applaud you for, you know, sort of uh, going through the process. Mm -hmm. And you definitely went through a process with that. Thank you so and much. And <laughs> you must, when you hear about things on the news, there's a lot of discussion about immigration mm -hmm. to this day. Mm -hmm. And most of it, maybe it's a little better now. We went through a dark period, but there is a lot of bad stuff. There's still kids in cages out there. So right. I just want to throw that And out so there. I know that you get involved in, uh, I guess I would call you an activist. You get involved in these issues and it's because you probably went through them yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I went through them myself. I saw my parents go through it, right? Like, uh, discrimination, right? That, that was biggest one, especially uh, my my dad and, and my brother uh, working in the restaurant field, right? Or working construction. Uh, you see that a lot. People look down at you because you might not know the language or you might not assimilate as, as quickly. But um, it is my understanding that the United States, it is a toss salad, as we call it. Uh, so I think that all cultures are are welcome to be here, uh, are welcome to be appreciated and understood. Um, and if we have to help our community out uh, to help assimilate or, or just get used to the way that we work, um, then so be it. That's what we're here for as people in our community. Well said. And I, you know, everyone thinks like, not everyone. Many people will suggest that it's come. It's easy to be coming over to this country, mm -hmm. and I mean, just and I always say, just think yourself what it would take for you to relocate and start your life again. Mm -hmm. And and you know, it's it's hard to imagine. I think for most people, someone coming over mm -hmm. and they're they're this sort of a, like a funny jealousy, like an opportunity. And, and uh, I, always, I always say, well, would you ever move to another country? I mean, things must have been really tough mm. for you to come over, mm. for sure. Um, so you went to NJCU, and then somehow you connected with the museum. How did that go about? Yeah. Come about? So uh, in 2014, I needed an internship class uh, at NJCU. And again, I knew uh, I wanted to do something in education. And I knew that I had an obsession with museums. I, I've always loved museums so much. Um, so I applied uh, to a few museums. And Hoboken Historical was one that, you know, called me. And I, I remember having the interview with you at the couch in the back and, and meeting you all. And I was like, wow, what an interesting place. Um, yeah, and then you welcomed me with open arms. Uh, you welcomed me to work with the education department. So shout out to Razel. Um, <laughs> Kylie, Here, we got uh, uh, Christopher on. It is Kylie. Nice to see you, Kylie. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry. It's Kylie oh, yeah. under uh, uh, Christopher's. Uh, yeah, um, they, um, they were part of like our museum program. So I do remember. Oh, my God. <laughs> Such good memories. It was great getting to know so many of the of the families and and their kids. So, so and nice. so, how did Razel Razel? You were in a sense you were interning under NJCU, mm -hmm. and you were partnered or mentored mm -hmm. with Razel. Yeah, you, you said the word. I I definitely even to this day I consider Razel um, my mentor, uh, especially when it comes to education. She taught me everything when it came to curriculum building, uh, to, to lesson plans, to my style of teaching, uh, to my organizational skills, because Razel is so organized. Um, and she she's she's very open to all my questioning. I question, as you know, I question everything so much. Um, so she was a great uh, lead into my education field here. And then after, you know, she had to leave, I, I was lucky enough to, uh, take over her her great right. work that she left behind. And you're still pretty good friends with Razel, I think. Yeah, Razel actually sits on our board of directors at True Mentors. 
Um, so uh, we are in very uh, constant communication. She, we are an acting board. So she uh, does some of our enrichment clubs. She recently helped out with an enrichment club where we taught our youth about Passover. Um, so that was very nice to see her talk about also her background. Right. Um, just a funny side story. I remember I was hanging a banner for Hoboken Talks to market it, to publicize this program. Yeah. And I was down by the path and I look over and I see you uh -huh. and, and Razel talking. I could hear your voices. Yeah. And for some reason, it took me forever to hang this banner and probably 20 minutes. And when I finished, I looked over and you were still, you know, conversing and it was like, you know, long lost friends. It was very cool. And I just thought it was ironic. And it was at that moment I said, we got to get Maria and eventually Razel on the program. Yes, so that's, that, that was the amazing. visual connection as we often make here. And so you work at the museum and I think, was it two years or? Yeah, I worked at the museum. Uh, I believe I, I came on in like October of uh, 2015, maybe. Okay. Um, you have and, a good memory. Yeah. <laughs> but prior to that, you know, I did the interning and, and I stood volunteering, right. I remember. Um, so it was a, a really nice transition. I got to do a little bit of everything. You did. You, that's what we do here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Work the gift shop. That's right. <laughs> and then uh, you took a job with where you still are working. Tell us about True Mentors and what you know you're doing there, and yeah. that that's here in Hoboken. Yes. Yeah, so True Mentors is also a nonprofit based out of uh, Hoboken, New Jersey. And we work with youth and volunteers from all over Hudson County. So we work with youth from West New York. Do you want to uh, say Jersey hi to City. Tana? I know we're oh, interrupting that's my here. Sister. Excellent. Where is she? She's also in La Serena, Chile. Oh my God. Um, so that's okay. A north okay. By the beach. Very nice cool. Weather. Very cool. Um, yeah. So uh, True Mentors. Uh, our mission is to uh, to work with our youth. Um, and true stands for uh, true relationships unearth excellence, and we we unearth the excellence of youth uh, through meaningful relationships. And the way that we do that is by uh, matching and pairing uh, youth with volunteers uh, from all walks of life, and we provide them with different programs, uh, which is mentoring is our longest running one. Uh, that's something I'm in charge of. Uh, we also have enrichment clubs, which are my favorite. That's where I used to volunteer. Um, and enrichment clubs run every Tuesday. We do uh, fun activities, whether it's like cooking, yoga, you know, the Passover lesson, et cetera. Um, we recently, out of COVID, uh, we now have a new program. It's called Homework Helpers, where we pair volunteers with youth who are struggling academically and they get to meet um, virtually. Uh, and then we also have a career readiness program for our high schoolers. So there we work with the Hoboken High School um, to get them uh, matched also with the volunteer who's going to help them with a career readiness checklist with the hopes of finding employment or an internship. Right. So lots it, of things we do. No, it sounds, wow, yeah. it's quite a menu. Mm -hmm. And then uh, where do you, some stuff might be virtual, but mm -hmm. where are you physically operating from? That's a great in question. In the good old days, at least. Yeah. So in the good old days, um, so when I started at True Mentors as a volunteer in 2016, we worked out of the Boys and Girls Club. So that's 123 Jefferson. And then we transitioned uh, into the Jubilee Center, 601 Jackson. Um, so we've done all of our programming there. And then when COVID hit in March, we, we went solely virtual. So okay. up to date... All of our programs are solely virtual. At the moment, True Mentors does not have a physical location, so we no longer work out of the Jubilee Center, and we're crossing our fingers that we go back to Boys and Girls Club or find another uh, place in Hoboken that we are welcome to, uh, to serve the youth. Okay. Um, so it sounds like you're adapting with uh, the times. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. absolutely. And so, are, and so are our participants. Right. Can you talk a little bit about what's going on with youth and COVID? You're on the front lines. Are you finding 
uh, you know, some positives from virtual programming or, and you're finding problems, you know, just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, that's a wonderful question. Um, so we've gone from about 45 participants uh, in an enrichment club. Um, and now that we are virtual, that's been cut in half. So some of our biggest programs virtually have been about 20 youth. Um, so yes, we have lost a few participants, but the beauty about small groups is the engagement, right? And that's uh, something that I um, love to have with, I call them my kids, but they're not, you know, our youth. They're your kids uh, too. And also uh, our volunteers. So it's a great way to engage. You know, sometimes when we start our programs, we'll do a quick check-in, right? So we're checking in, how's everyone doing? Give me one word. And if I see someone that's like, I'm having a bad day, we're going to talk about it as a group. So we'll have a, a youth like Kimberly who, you know, will tell me why she's having a bad day or how she feels it's unfair that her school is closing for two weeks for a COVID case. So it's beautiful to see them uh, talk and, and use their voice as well. Um, so that's, you know, that's the beauty of COVID. Um, right, because they're not actually in a formal class and you really are asking them to speak. And right. so rather than fill in it all with dialogue, like the silence is probably good. And then they unfold a little bit. Yeah, they're they're definitely, um, <laughs> they're very vocal and they're very open, which right. I love because uh, that's something I, I do. Um, so it's nice to see them engaging. But there's also, you know, some downfalls. You mentioned, you know, like what's happening with our youth during COVID and our youth are very stressed out. You know, it's it's a big, big change, especially for some youth who come from a low income family who do not have laptops, who might be sharing a laptop with other siblings, right? who are uh, getting stressed out because they have to uh, submit homework. That's my mom. Oh, cool. <laughs> my mom. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, they're getting stressed out. They have to submit homework. They have to pass all this. So uh, it's a big change. It's also a big change for the guardians, right? Some guardians have had to uh, bring some of their their uh, their kids to work or, or maybe stop working because they have to take care of kids. So. Uh, True Mentors is supporting that, hence why we build the homework help programs. So we are in constant uh, dialogue with uh, all of the household, all members. So whether it's the youth, the guardian, we talk about it with the volunteer too, to see how they could also support. Right. Now, it's a lot of ground to cover. And mm -hmm. I think when you mentioned, uh, you know, most Hoboken apartments, uh, are, many of them are very small. Mm -hmm. And if you have a few kids in the house and mm -hmm. don't have a strong bandwidth and they're mm -hmm. sharing and mm -hmm. just even the noise level, you know, it can be. And then if the parents are working at home, it's it's kind of a little crazy. Absolutely. And sometimes it's it's the culture, too, of the household. We need to understand that. Um, quick example, I had a volunteer a few weeks ago email me saying that the youth had too much noise around him. <laughs> so I had to talk to this household who is of Dominican background, right? Dominican Republic tends to be very loud. And I could say that because I grew up in West New York. Um, so I had to talk to the guardian, you know, let's work out of his bedroom where it's quieter. Maybe let's put on headphones. So it's, it's a learning moment for everyone, you know, for the volunteer to understand a little bit, right. right. Um, for the household as well. And, and for myself, cause no one's ever done virtual programs before. <laughs> and so you've been, you've been in Hoboken, you're working in Hoboken for a while mm. and you, Let's say you started at the museum mm -hmm. and now you're with True Mentors. Mm -hmm. And we always think of Hoboken as uh, economically almost being a, a tale of two cities. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a, maybe a concentration uh, uptown of, shall we say, more wealth. And then as you go west, it changes. Mm -hmm. And do, uh, uh, have you, do you agree with that? Or, you know, wh what do you think? Is, is that a real problem in Hoboken? 
Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, I probably told you I wasn't going to ask any like real, no, you know, intense fine. questions, but I know it's I kind of an, in, <laughs> it's an interest of yours mm-hmm. and don't yeah. want to shy away from it. But yeah, well, class division is very real. <laughs> um, but actually my, my working in Hoboken, uh, starts prior to the museum, as you know, uh, to get through college, to pay through my, uh, student loans, I had to be a waitress. So Hoboken was actually the place that uh, brought me here to wait, right? And not for anything, coming from West New York, which is a low-income community, we know to go work in Hoboken because that's where you're going to make money because that's where the restaurants are more expensive than Line Avenue, right? So um, yeah, that was my first uh, kind of wake-up call in Hoboken to be the server, right? Now serving affluent folks, um, and then also understanding the difference between myself, the people who are there dining, right? Uh, And then also the people in the kitchen, in the back, right? Which are many of Latinx, mostly immigrant uh, background. So that to me was like my first wake up call, right? The idea of you know, I am a server, there are kitchen staff, will we ever be able to live in these beautiful brownstones or, or condominiums that we see here? So that was, I'm going to be very honest, that was my first. I'm glad you brought it up. Yeah. And and then working at the museum also, um, it, it was interesting because we worked a lot with, you know, charter schools. Um, and I got to see the difference in the education of the charter school um, curriculum and, and kids, uh, and then also the public schools. So hence why I was so adamant about bringing the public schools here, uh, because I remember as a kid going uh, to museum field trips, and, and I really think that it was kind of like that little seed that was planted in me, which now became my obsession. So I want to give that back, right? Um, and then Hoboken, Historical Museum works with the uptown community, which is a little more affluent. And now working with True Mentors, I get to work with the other side. Uh, most households of low income, as we say, who mostly reside uh, in the housing authority. Um, so it's it's a very different approach that we work with. Uh, and I get to see that class division that we have, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> it's there. It's there. Um, maybe we'll go to some of the pictures, which uh, will cover some of the areas we've talked about, but it's kind of fun to visualize them. And I think we're starting off with family shots and you're going to have to tell us who's who. OK, um, so that's my so my oldest sister is to the right. And then in the middle is my mother. Uh, and then to the left is my older brother. So I am the baby of the household. And I don't know, my brother must have been like 15 and my sister 19 around there. Right. So this is uh, in Chile. <coughs> yes, that okay. is uh, in Las Condes, which huh. is a, a borough of Santiago de Chile. Uh-huh. <coughs> and we're and family gathering. Yeah, uh, you mentioned, like, if I remember anything, uh, definitely family gatherings. We we had a huge family, so cousins, uncles, that, right? So that's my brother, that's my Theo Jaime, that's my uh, tata, my grandfather, that's my father, my mom, and then me, and then around that table is a whole bunch of other family members. Right, right. And we're moving that's my dad. Uh, that was at one of the first restaurants I think he worked in. It was called Chalan Restaurant. So it was like a Chilean Peruvian restaurant, which funny story about that. He ended up owning that restaurant. So he worked really hard because he wanted to be a restaurateur. So he worked really hard to obtain that dream. <laughs> The American dream. <laughs> okay. And I guess I should ask his get up is, uh, how do you explain the clothing or he's wearing makeup or no, no, my dad is the one in white. Oh, okay. I'm he's sorry. So server. the other gentleman is yeah, a performer. I think, or... Yeah. I think I remember that restaurant having like a lot of performances on the weekend. Okay. So it must've been something like that. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's my mom to the left um, with her English teacher. Uh, so my mom, I remember like when I was growing up, she would go to the evening school so she could learn English 
uh, and then other like traits. Uh, so she was she was really big on education. Uh huh. Yeah. And, and she kind of instilled that in you. Oh yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> to this day, like better get a bunch of degrees, and right. I'm like yes. <laughs> so I actually remember this woman coming in who was like I think a, a high school teacher in West New York, yeah. and. Um, I don't know how it even came up, mm. but she she said you were like the best student she ever had. You know, that and was she, Stegman. Yeah, and she could she was so impressed that you could learn English mm. so well. Yeah. You know, at that age. She was my reading specialist. Okay. Actually, you know, you mentioned hurdles, so that was one of my hurdles. Like I had to have a reading specialist and go to speech. Um so yeah, it's nice that those uh educators remember me and that they played uh, such a pivotal role in who I am today. <laughs> uh -huh. Cool. And let's see. Mm, so that's kindergarten with my first teacher ever, Miss Ferrer. Uh, and she, she started teaching me uh, English. That's my little graduation ceremony. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. So funny. Mm. Um, so that was my first grade classroom. Uh, and the reason I chose that picture, it's because it's very interesting how we are such a diverse group of, of kids, right? Uh, all from different uh, countries and all different backgrounds. Uh, so one of, of them in the white, um, she was my best friend, Sarah, who is still my friend today. Wow. Of Venezuelan background, also immigrated to the States. And she used to teach me English after school. So my mom made sure that I was learning English through every different backgrounds, whether right. it was in school, my friends, like after school programs. So shout out to Sarah, a uh, very special place in my heart. It worked. <laughs> <sighs> mm -hmm. So that's high school. I was in the band. I played the flute. I played the flute from uh, third grade all the way to 12th grade. And then in high school, I got to be in the marching band. Uh, if you guys don't know, marching band is a sport. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. I was never sporty. I was always artsy. But I guess I could say I was part of a club, sport club or something right, like that. Right, <laughs> right, right. Do you still play? <gasps> no, not really. <laughs> <laughs> you have other sports. Yeah. <laughs> Mm, yeah, so that um, also I was part of the chess club. That was like a summer program. That that summer program actually, they would take us to NGCU. Really, during the summers. So right. I knew the campus mm -hmm. before actually getting accepted. Right. So that was really cool. So that's me graduating uh, from NGCU. I really don't like that picture, honestly. You look a little I, smug. I, I must know, say. I I it's don't like, like it. My mom's like, no, you have to show the fact that you graduated. Um, but yeah, it, it took a while for me to graduate, uh, from, from college. It took me seven years. I went through some hurdles. Uh, one of them, uh, being was that like my family did, uh, go through a fire. So, you know, I, I was out of school for a bit cause I had to Got some physical therapy. Um, but, you know, I graduated with my degree in sociology in 2015. So I'm proud of myself for that. Um, I know you, when you worked here at the museum, part of your responsibilities took you to the Fireman Museum mm -hmm. under our good friend Billy Bergen, who's deceased. Um, but I don't think I ever heard the story, but I remember Billy calling me up and saying, you got to hear the story that Maria just told me about the fire she had when she was growing up. Uh -huh. So I've never heard it. You just kind of mentioned it. Uh -huh. Do you mind relating what happened? Yeah, no. Um, it definitely was another hurdle, right? I, I think those things make us stronger and just make us persevere. Um, so in 2009, February of 2009, uh, I, I suffered a fire in my house. I was, it must have been 08 or 09 been so long now. Um, and I was a freshman in college at Hudson Community College and my house was on fire and my mom and I lived together and uh, there was no way to escape out because the stairs were filled with smoke. So we had to climb out the window onto the roof. Uh, and because the flames were, were so close to us, we had to jump 
and in jumping, I um, shattered my lumbar spine. Um, so I was very immobile for, for a long time. I had to like, I had to first learn how to walk again, which was mm -hmm. so scary. Like through a walker, I felt like elderly, I guess. Uh, and then I had to wear like a cast for a long time, even after uh, going back to work because I was a waitress at the time. I always had to work with like, you know, something on. Um, so I've, I've learned a lot about my body after that, right? Like honoring it. <laughs> so, but you healed. Yeah, I, I did heal. Um, you know, things are kind of different sometimes. Like one part hurts a little more. I know when it's going to rain because I have a metal rod in my, you know, in my back. Um, so I'm like, ooh, I, I feel old, but, you know. And Still mobile. You left out, like, was that second floor, third floor that you jumped down? We lived down? on the third floor, so yeah. So then we had to go up. Yeah, so it was it was quite, yeah. And my mom, too, you know, my mom was much older. Thankfully, she she didn't break it. I broke it. She shattered it. So she didn't have to go through a severe uh, operation like I did. Um, but it was, it was a lot for us. You know, after, after that, you know, we lost our home. Uh, Salvation Army helped us out a lot. Memorial High School, I, I, Memorial High School will always have a special place in my heart because they worked collectively to help us with furniture, with clothing, with donations. So again, I think that's why I love working with the community and just like helping out the community because I've been helped so much that I just Elizabeth, I want to give it back. Elizabeth <laughs> says she's a warrior. That's why. Aww. I agree. Thank I agree. You, that means so much to me. <laughs> um, and so, you know, that's like over, could be 30 feet, you yeah, know, three was, stories, eight yeah. foot, 10 foot. So. Yeah. Sometimes when I think about it, I'm like, I always blame my mom though. Cause she jumped Ooh. first. She jumped first. I wouldn't have jumped. She jumped. So I just had to, had to follow her. <laughs> <laughs> and she probably remembers it slightly differently. She's fearless. Yeah, yeah. definitely. And uh, tell us a little more about your mom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my mom has always instilled education in, in all of us, right? Like, even my sister, <laughs> it would like, we would joke, like, my sister is the smartest one. <laughs> and then my brother is like the artsy one. So even even to that, like, she would say, like, you know, get your certificates. Uh, he loves photography. So he went to NYU to take some courses on that. And, and with me, you know, even today, she's like, you have to follow uh, with more degrees, etc. So um, she's very strong willed in that case. Um, you know, she's coming up almost on 70 and she refuses to retire. She's still working. <laughs> you might see her around Hoboken. Uh, so, yeah, my mom means a lot to me. She, and she's so where, did, where, you know, that's sort of the classic immigrant story of mm. people coming from another country and mm. and one of the parents pushing education, education. Mm. Where do you think she got that credo from? Oh, definitely my grandfather. She would say that my grandfather was very strict, that if they didn't get good grades, you know, they would be in trouble. Um, and she would tell me stories like that she was like the valedictorian in, in, in Chile. And and growing up, I would always see her read. Um, so I, I think it just stems from, from her household, the, the Garcia, right? So my name is Maria Fernanda Lara Garcia. So Definitely the Garcia household. Cool. And then the fire thing, I mean, that type of trauma is pretty intense. Mm -hmm. um, just kind of like if you hear a fire engine mm -hmm. today or you smell smoke, do you mm -hmm. kind of go back? That's a good question. So for a while, uh, my mom, that definitely was a PTSD she had. So anytime it would be a fire engine, we would be in the car, and she'll get, she'll panic so much. So it was definitely something that we had to work on. Uh, thankfully, it's, it's not there anymore. Um, for a while myself, I could not sleep. I could not go to bed knowing that my doors were unlocked. I would always like check the oven. Like it was, you know, again, thankfully it's not there. But today... If I know that there is a candle lit somewhere and there is no one near it, I will turn it off because it's just, it's my fear. Like fires could happen in a split second. They could be electrical. They could, you know, so right. definitely some trauma there. Sure, sure. Ian, oh, Ian, Ian signed on a few weeks ago and I missed, I didn't even understand this uh, text panel on the bottom. 
and I'll have to watch the parts I've missed so far. I forgot it started. Hello, Bob and Maria. Yeah. Ian, I believe, is in Portland or oh, Seattle. Dope. And uh, right. miss West. him and think of him often. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope things are good for you, Ian. Yeah, me there. too. And, and thank you for all the great work you put in the fire museum because that's it right. for him, you yeah. wouldn't have done such right. a great job. The there. fireman museum has been closed mm -hmm. during this just because uh, ventilation wasn't that great. And and so as soon as I, I keep on saying one more weather, great weather day like today, mm -hmm. and we'll start to open it up again. But it is missed. We've been doing the virtual programs with Jack, mm -hmm. but usually we get a couple of phone calls a week saying, are you open? Mm -hmm. Meaning they're calling this number, mm -hmm. but they're really, t if you hear kids in the background, you got, you better ask, do you mean 213 Bloomfield or 1301 right. Hudson? Oh, so they and, still get Yeah, because we're still the contact number right, for right. both. So. I'm sure the kids miss it. And I understand why it's not open, right? It was very hands-on museum. They right. got to touch everything. So, um, but yeah, it would be great if, it was it, it's going to happen soon. I can feel it. Cool. I can feel it <laughs> on there. Um, so we had a few more pictures, I think. And uh, this, <laughs> similar to our backdrop picture, yeah. but as I said, I think this is before we did pre-registration for story yeah, time. And there'd be a certain point you got to, you said, you got to knock those numbers down. It's yeah. like, it's like uh, a riot of kids. Yeah, I would get and, um, but, <laughs> but that, that was classic. That was in the walkway. Yeah. And obviously it was actually too many people for inside. Mm. Uh, we've had, we call it Penny's story time mm. after Penny, so uh, Penny match who started it. Mm. Uh, we've had other story time readers, uh, uh, in a real panic, I've done it. And <laughs> it's probably the scariest thing to do for the first That's time. Awesome. Yeah. I, I think Good I, you. yeah, there was, Did it's you been, sing the songs? I sang the songs. That was the best part, actually. But when you read a book and you're not sure if you're connecting, mm. very scary. Yeah. But you yeah, were, you were engaged. You had the, the, the well, pacing. Well, you got to do the facial expression. Right. That's how you draw them, right? right. Like, sure. But reading facial expressions, riot control, it's <laughs> tough. It's tough. Anyway, and uh, I just wanted to ah, tell us about that picture. And yeah, no, uh, this is a special picture for me um, because uh, after watching Delivered Bacon, I was so obsessed with that film, first of all. I was obsessed with the whole story behind it. If anyone watching here hasn't watched Delivered Bacon, do so because it definitely talks about that division of... Hoboken. Um, but Nora Jacobson, who, you know, uh, produced it, uh, I got to meet her. I got to see her in New York City for her and then here. Uh, and we did a, a film festival. I think it was like a month long film festival. And we showed different short films and then hers. And then we had a Q&A. Um, so that was very much a highlight in my in my story here. And you were you curated and put together those events. It wasn't like yeah. a film festival That's just cool. showed up here. You picked films and mm. you know created uh, dialogue mm. after the film. And uh, yeah. just to put it in a little more context, Nora Jacobson. Chicken emergency. That's right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I. I would have cut that one out. We showed out, that one to youth, though. That's true. And they came. They, they <laughs> did. So awesome. Yes, definitely. The good old days, yeah. as we say. Um, but Nora Jacobson has made the, you know, sort of the a very important documentary, mm -hmm. which just happens to portray Hoboken in the 90s and deals with gentrification. Mm -hmm. uh, Nora moved on to Vermont, mm -hmm. but she came here special, mm -hmm. you know, and she talked about, wow, I, you know, I, I'm so glad I met Maria. So mm -hmm. that was a good thing. Yeah, she was very nice. Her and Holly. <laughs> shout out to Holly. Another shout of you. Yeah, it was family Engaging. fun day. Yeah, yep, one of our fun family day. fun days, right? Yeah, my favorite sure. things. Right. Just engaging with, with youth of any age level. Right. Other yeah. classes in the museum. I think that's from the first World War I exhibit. We've yes. done two. And... Uh, uh, that's one of the teachers we still engage with, actually. 
Yeah, so pretty if cool. I am not mistaking, that might be Hoboken Charter School. I think that's um, right. And I really like that image because the young boy is so engaged, right? Like, like, look at him. His eyes are just direct into uh, the artifact. And I, I think that's something that, like, drew me into my work as museum educator uh, because I remember when I was their age, I didn't like history. I just I thought history was boring. And it wasn't until, um, actually it wasn't until high school, I took a Vietnamese studies class. I was like, wow, that's cool. But then I came here and it, it was just, you know, evidence-based learning is, is real. And that's a great way to engage youth. Um, so I definitely prided myself in, in doing that and, and making them like history, <laughs> which now I love. I love history. <laughs> okay, you're, you're in the right place. <laughs> Mm. Uh, this is from another program that mm -hmm. you produced. I think Razel started them mm -hmm. and then you continued it. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, we're not currently doing this program, but can mm -hmm. you explain it? Yeah. So I remember uh, Razel did uh, the first poetry in the schools with Danny Schott. And then I worked on, I think this was like the second or, or third one that you had. Um, and then we were talking about like topics that we wanted to do. And also uh, a guest poet that we wanted to bring in to work with the schools. Uh, and through my prior roommate. Um, There's Felipe Lara. <laughs> that's my brother, Felipe. Very cool. Very cool. Who, who you know vaguely, kind of. I know He's he in Hudson you. County. Yeah, he lives right? in Jersey City. Okay, yes, we have Pacific met. Pacific he's, Avenue. He's the photographer. Yeah, he loves right. photography. Yeah, Maybe cool. he'll be here one day. <laughs> could be, could be. Um, yeah, so the Poetry in the Schools program I thought was great. Um, we brought in Rob Hilton, who is of Jamaican background, another immigrant to the United States. Um, and he currently works for the Newark uh, public school system as an English teacher. Um, and he worked on poetry, but he worked through slam poetry, which is one of my favorite style of poetry. And I think it's also a great way to engage it with youth because slam poetry has a lot of background with hip hop and a lot of youth like hip hop, right? And since we're working with high schoolers, it was a perfect um, kind of like mesh to bring in together. And I do remember that this program uh, also brought in the highest number of youth from Hoboken High School, which the previous ones didn't as much. So I was very proud of that. Yeah, and this, the title, is, and this is 2018, so I think it's the last one you worked on. Mm. And um, I, I always liked that program because it was one of the few events where kids from all the schools would gather yes. and kind of got to... Uh, they weren't competing, but they were able to share what they had learned about, you know, poetry. And they did a reading of each of their poems. Right. Well, they were able to learn new skills, right? Which is always the best thing. And uh, whether they were competing or not, they were putting those skills to the test. They were learning through others' um, performance styles or, or poetry. And, and yeah, meeting new faces because even though they might go to different schools, Hoboken is such a small city that they most likely saw each other, whether it was at the Boys and Girls Club or like Washington Street right. or the basketball court. Oh, but Bill. it kind of remind. Oh, oh, there's Bill Curran. Bill Curran. I love okay, Bill. he's awesome. He's a great artist. Yes, he is. Um, and uh, but again, like like so seldom would let's say the charter school do something with the public mm -hmm. high school, mm -hmm. you know, except for maybe competing in a sport, mm -hmm. but here they were mm -hmm. in a sense sharing their poems. Right. And yeah. there was, you know, some were very political, some were very personal and, mm -hmm. but they were curated yes. and it was, it was, uh, you had such a good feeling being in the room. Yeah. So really. I, I do miss that too. And, Ah, oh, what a beautiful shot. Mm, Machu Picchu. Where are you? You're not on Bergen Line. Um, oh, maybe, you know, uh, that is Machu Picchu, Peru. Uh, so that's uh, Andes Mountains, Las Montañas de los Andes. Uh, and you mentioned you're not in Bergen Line, right? But I took that trip to learn more about culture, about the culture of the Andes, where I'm from. I'm from the Andes. Um, and it wasn't until I came back from that trip that I was like, I didn't have to go to Peru to try Peruvian food because Bergeline just had it. <laughs> and it was just. It was, that's, that oh, that's is interesting. My, that's my aunt from Florida, Tia Jackie. Oh, oh excellent. Wow. Excellent. So she, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. <laughs>
<laughs> um, so yeah, that that was uh, that was me traveling. Uh, that's me in Bolivia. Uh, so again, I uh, after you know I left the museum uh, prior to working to True Mentors, I did take about a year of traveling. Uh, and my goal was to travel all throughout the Andes because that's where I'm from. Um, so I traveled uh, throughout Ecuador and Chile and Argentina, Bolivia, Peru, uh, Colombia. So that that was my goal to learn more about the culture um, of people from the Andes. Mm -hmm. So cool. it was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's uh, then I, I came back, and then in November of 2019, uh, I got hired as program coordinator for True Mentors. Uh, so that's me uh, with one of our youth from our homework help program. But I actually knew him when I was an enrichment club teacher, uh, Emmanuel and his little brother. So he's now part of our homework help program. And actually, um, oh, there's Lisa. Lisa. Lisa's so sweet. Hey, Lisa. Uh, I'll see you at the beer garden sometimes. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't know where I was going. I'm getting a little overwhelmed. No, but yeah, yeah, no, this is this is great. Sure. Thank you so much. Mm, this is recently, this is during COVID. Um, I'm actually very proud of this program. Um, we also launched a program with our teens, apart from career readiness, we launched a program called Youth Leadership where we tackled topics of uh, social justice and change. Um, so Daquan uh, facilitated one of them. Shout out to Daquan, he's awesome. Uh, but this one, we worked actually with the Hoboken Pantry, so the community center, and they talked to us a little bit about food insecurity, which is so pivotal to what is going on with so many communities during COVID. Um, and then we, so that was done virtually, that workshop. And then in person uh, during Martin Luther King Jr. Day, uh, day of service, uh, we took some of our teens to the food pantry and we got them, you know, to, you know, do bags, et cetera. So they learned about volunteer work, uh, which is so important. Sometimes uh, communities of low income don't think about volunteering because they're not gaining, you know, money, what we're taught to. Um, but here they're gaining experiences, they're gaining skills, they're gaining community involvement. So uh, those are those are some of our kids. That's Evan there. He's so That's awesome. in the YMCA, right? That is yeah. in the YMCA. I, I yes. used to teach classes there years ago, and I recognized their architecture. Yep, that is, <laughs> yeah. No, you should see what it's now. It's just the pantry is doing a wonderful job in Hoboken. Um, Tony Tamarazzo uh, is one of the board members, so we have a great relationship with her through True Mentors, um, and then also out of knowing that the food pantry gives some non-perishables. Um, True Mentors decided to do our own pantry, uh, but ours is different. We call it Produce Giveaway. So once a month on a Monday, we give our household fresh fruits, vegetables, and herbs uh, because we understand uh, that through pantries and sometimes uh, food stamps, you don't get the freshest food, right? Sure. It was interesting to see some of our youth never uh, knew what a papaya was, right? So we'll give it to them. <laughs> yeah. um, food's always a great way to connect, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Nourishing food. Yes. People get it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I know that you're involved in a lot of social issues and tell us about this shot. Well, I like to be involved, right? Um, so this was last summer, right? Uh, Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and this was so important to me one, because I, you know, peak COVID. So everyone's like, you're crazy. You're going to go protesting. Like, don't you think about others? And I'm like, yeah, I do think about others. That's why I'm going to go protest. Right. Um, but that shot is in Bergerline Avenue, right? Where I grew up. And it was, it was insane to see so many people marching down the street, you know, young people, old people, like you see my mom there, like fearlessly with her Spanish sign. Um, and it was just a beautiful moment to see how like Hudson County came together. You also see the background, right? Like a lot of the uh, organizers of this march are very, very young people. So 
I don't know, college base freshmen in college, maybe some high schoolers. So it, it's beautiful to see the change that is happening in our um, in our community and how the youth are no longer uh, quiet about it. Right. So so they no, no longer resisting. They're out there. They're they're speaking out. They're voicing their opinions and. I'm right there with them uh, to do it. So yeah. um, I can like Bergen line is kind of tight, mm -hmm. you know, and that's one of the special qualities mm -hmm. of it. So mm -hmm. I can just imagine it must have been really intense. Yeah. It started all the way in 80th park, right? All the way down to Celia Cruz drive. So it started from those double streets to the little street. You know, we stopped, we took knees in different, um, different places, you know, calling out the name George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, um, and just, just educating. It was really interesting too, to see like some of the storefronts, like some of the people just walk out to see what's happening. Um, so that was beautiful. Were uh, storefronts boarded up on Bergen Line? Okay. So because I also came to the Hoboken March. Okay. Talk about that a little. Yes. So Hoboken boarded up everything, right? <laughs> Burger line, no, no. Oh, interesting. <laughs> so it, you, you see the difference, right? But, and also you see the difference, why? Because uh, there's more value in Hoboken, right? Properties are, are much more expensive. So uh, it was it was very interesting to kind of see that difference. The Hoboken March was also uh, beautiful. It just went around all over. I also went to the Newark one. So yeah, very, very active in, in voicing uh, my my voice and, and just my knowledge of, of things. And um, my mom would always be like, don't go to protest, but there you there see she is. Me, yeah. So. <laughs> sorry, I, not sorry. <laughs> right. But I mean, <laughs> I don't know how to relate, but like, my era youth growing up would have been protesting the Vietnam War. Mm -hmm. And that was so like partially like self-interest, like I don't want to go or mm -hmm. I don't want to be drafted. Mm -hmm. And which is very different, you know, from the protests of the last, you know, couple of years, I would say. Mm -hmm. uh, but the idea of going to a protest, the protest, the Vietnam War with one of my parents would just like, not be cool. Uh -huh. So I met several people who mm -hmm. it was it was primarily women who brought who came went with their mom, and like that's amazing. Yeah, no, I I agree. I I, I always say that uh, we should educate everyone, not only the youth, right? But we we should also educate uh, older folks because they grew up in different times and, and times are, are changing. Um, and that's why, you know, my sign says educate racist Latinx in our community, because, uh, within Latin America, there is so much racism, right? Um, that is something that I saw firsthand in my travels. Um, so let's, uh, educate the older community who, some of them are in politics, right? Or mayor of West New York. So let's educate them uh, so they could understand how to change policies um, to make our, our, you know, our systems more effective. Right. I mean, it's been amazing to watch mm -hmm. the, the, yeah. the protests mm -hmm. and uh, it is coming from the youth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, absolutely. I think connecting a lot through social media mm -hmm. and Many times it's not really even covered by the news, like this rat and this march is coming up and all of a sudden it's here, mm. you know, and it's very exciting mm. actually. Um, so is that our last photo, do we think? Okay, we've been, I think we've been, we you were it. worried that we, you know, are we gonna go 15, 20 minutes? I think we went the full hour. Cool. Um, is there anything else you want to share with people? You, I think you gave a great shout out uh, to True Mentors and other people, but anything else? Um, I mean, I first want to thank the Hoboken Historical Museum because I think uh, if it wasn't for me working here, I wouldn't be as passionate as I am about history, right? About questioning everything. You hated it, right? Yeah, um, <laughs> I think that the... The fact that I was able to work in a in a setting that investigated history um, led way to my own ways of doing research, right? So when I when I questioned something, uh, you know, systemic racism, right? That's something real. So I was able to research it, to learn more about it, more in depth. And then also, if it wasn't for working in a historical setting, 
I wouldn't question my own history, right? So again, being brought to the States, I was taught to assimilate into the American culture and I lost my own. Uh, so it wasn't until I worked here that then I started questioning the community in, in West New York, right? And then my own community in Chile. So I just, I want to shout out you for giving me, um, you know, such a open space to learn. Um, and then also all of Hoboken because Hoboken has been so welcoming to me. Um, I've met so many parents, so many kids, so many educators that just like extend themselves to me. Um, oh, Greg Delaquilla, thank you so much. <laughs> um, so yeah, just Hoboken taught me a lot about um, partnerships and, and what it is to be in a community because Hoboken is so close and tight. So I just want to be able to um, do that for, for the rest of my life if I can. <laughs> but... I happen to know that you have relocated. Mm -hmm. So yeah. part of your time, uh, your, where are you, uh, shall we say, residing these days? Yeah, so I, I actually recently moved to <laughs> uh, New York City, which is like right there. Um, I moved to Brooklyn. Uh, and the reason I did that was, as you know, I've lived in Hudson County, New Jersey my whole life. Uh, so I just, I wanted a change. Um, and specifically in Brooklyn, I moved to Bushwick because Bushwick is one of the areas in Brooklyn that are heavy uh, populated by uh, the Latinx community, especially Mexican. So um, it's been a nice change for me because now I ride the subway all the time. Uh, but also it's very similar to Hudson County. Like from my window, I, I listen to... Dominican music all the time. Like my neighbors are just blasting it. So I'm like, oh, I did, I'm home, you know, just, just there's a subway out my window. Well, not out my window, but like I see it. Sure. So sure. I love it. I love it. I love the diversity of New York City. Um, and I think the museum used to say that Hoboken was like that extended borough, right? Um, well, we joked that we're the sixth six borough. Sixth borough, right. Yes. So, I mean, I would say Hudson County is the sixth borough because so many similarities. Right. So, um, but I still work for True Mentors. So I'm very <laughs> proud of that. Uh, currently, I get to work remote and uh, I come to the office or, yeah, our office um, once a week. So I'm, I'm always in Hoboken. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, when you're talking about like the opportunity here at the museum that you were given, mm -hmm. um, but you were ready to seize that moment. A lot of people couldn't have picked up the way you did. So just throwing it back to you as being, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. your timing is everything and it was the right time and it was a great two years, I think, or mm -hmm. a little plus if you had the other things. Mm -hmm. But I think you really, you know, did, did us well and yourself well. Thank so you. Glad that you're means so glad much you're to out me. there doing your thing, Aww, and uh, so uh, and uh, we'd love to see you more often. And uh, if there's a way to work together on some project, that window is that window and door is always open, mm -hmm. and so we can talk about that offline sometime. Um, so I think we're concluding here. Uh, we've probably. Uh, want to promote a little bit some of the upcoming shows. So next week, uh, Roxanne Hoffman will be interviewed by Lois Delivio. And then uh, Terry Francis, a longtime friend of the museum, will be interviewed by our own Bill Curran. So we, the programs keep coming. Uh, we will take a skip next week, a April 15th. Uh, but uh, we're really happy to continue this programming. Usually we're not doing these programs, shall we say, to, uh, you know, be a revenue, shall we say, for the museum. But if anyone is interested in supporting the museum, uh, you can go to our website. It's very easy to donate, and we'd love that to have happen. Uh, a big shout out to supporters of the museum. Uh, uh, Donald Shackett, who uh, passed, uh, uh, oh, I'm, I don't have the date, but it will say a little while ago, made a very generous donation in his estate planning. And then, uh, of course, Applied Companies are the ones who supply us with the gorgeous space that we have and are big supporters every year corporately. So, again, thank you for joining us. 
And uh, again, a many thanks to Rand Hoppe, who was our producer and uh, engineer. And we think this program went flawless. Okay, what do you think? Yeah, I agree. Shout out to Rand. You're okay. awesome. Okay, okay. We're signing out. Thank you very much. And see you on the avenue, as they